elections facing funding challenges. Soldiers committed to trial. And lay police arrest robbery suspect. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me for Thursday's news. The Electoral Commission has less than six months to fully prepare for the elections next year. However, Commissioner Patilias Gamato is optimistic that they will be ready in time for the issue of writs on the 20th of April next year. Mr. Gamato was at a workshop this afternoon with political party executives where he gave updates on the preparation for the coming elections. Even after I've completed the appointments of the retaining officers and national retaining officers and gadgeted them, some people are coming to me and asking for changes. Once the appointments are gadgeted, it's finalized. I can only do changes if there is a death of the retaining officer or if there is misspelling of a person's name, or if there is duplication of name. But if you come and ask me to change, I won't change it. I'm making this point clear so that you as political executives of the political parties understand. I have to move on in terms of training the retaining officers so that get, they can start working on the electoral roll. He said funding remains their biggest challenge but they have managed to send some money to provinces to get trainings done. So we have now uh, conducted and completed our first level training. Okay, our first level training involves the training of the retaining officers, sorry, election managers and the assistant election managers. So we have completed that, that was done in Lane in August 22 to 25th. And the second level training is the training of the retaining officers and assistant retaining officers. The election schedule for now will see issue of writs and nominations open on the 20th of April 2017. Seven days later, nominations will close and two weeks of polling will be from the 24th of June to the 8th of July. The return of writs for the national elections will be on the 24th of July and for the LLG elections on the 7th of August. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. Third-level airlines that serve rural communities in Papua New Guinea are being burdened by the high costs brought on by the drop in the value of the kina. Various airline representatives have pointed out that nearly all their expenses are in U.S. dollars and the recent drops in the kina value have driven up their costs. For airlines like the Missionary Aviation Fellowship that operate in some of the most isolated regions of Papua New Guinea, they have to contend with high maintenance costs which have to be paid for in U.S. dollars. When the kina drops by several points, it translates to several thousands of kina that they have to spend. MAF also operates seven piston engine aircraft. Piston engines use aviation gas which is in short supply in Papua New Guinea. Six PNG Defense Force soldiers have been committed to stand a trial at the National Court for the murder of a teenage boy in Port Moresby last year. Waigani District Court Magistrate John Kalmi ruled that there was sufficient evidence found to commit the six. At the end of this month, the six soldiers will have one final opportunity to appeal to the court's leniency. The six defendants are Francis Nasi, Jude Nidung, David Tape, Kenneth Yangun, Tabias Simpson, Gregory Tuwaki, and Alwin Matiabe. All are between the ages of 25 and 26. Magistrate Kaumi handed down a short ruling this morning. He committed them to the National Court and ordered their lawyer to file a Section 96 statement in reply to the ruling of forever remain silent. It was alleged that a fight broke out between a group of students from Kila Kila Secondary and the defendants on the morning of 25th July 2015. The court had that the students were on their way to Kila Kila Secondary for Cultural Day celebrations when two of the soldiers approached them and assaulted them. That evening, the late Jeremiah Yinu 
who was a student at the Salvation Army Secondary, was mistaken for one of the Kila Kila students and badly assaulted by two of the defendants who were alleged to have been under the influence of alcohol at that time. All six were charged for one count of murder under the Criminal Code Act. Their bail has been extended. Vasenata Yama, National MTV News. Lay police have arrested and charged a 57-year-old man allegedly involved in the armed robbery at the Lay International Hotel last month. Lay Metropolitan Commander Chief Superintendent Anthony Wagambi says the man was the human resource manager in one of the big firms in Lay. He is believed to have allowed the criminals to use his company-issued vehicle to execute the armed holdup. CCTV footages obtained from police hinted that the same vehicle may have been used in a previous armed robbery at the Lake Travelers Inn last month. The vehicle has been impounded and the 57-year-old suspect is now in police custody. The identities of the other criminals involved are known. And uh, it comes as a surprise for somebody who was a very high position in the company and an elderly person to be involved in this sort of crime. It's not the first time. Police believe the recent robberies that were executed were done by experienced criminals. Criminals are now using legally owned vehicles as their getaway cars. This is becoming a new trend in the city. Crimes are becoming more planned and more sophisticated. Uh, we, we, we have left that... Uh, uh, all crimes where they come up where it's a uh, thing which is done randomly, it's not being done like that anymore. Um, I'd say 95% 95, 95 of the time, or maybe 98% of, of the time, the robbery is being committed uh, inside jobs. In the last three months, four business houses, including Lay International Hotel, Pelgans, Plant Trade, and Papindo, were robbed. Most of these crimes that were committed saw criminals escaping on boats as police were not able to pursue criminals. The Lay Metropolitan Command will need a water policing unit to assist them go after criminals escaping on speedboats. Lay Metropolitan Commander Chief Superintendent Anthony Wagambi has made a 250,000 kina submission earlier this year to the Moroba Provincial Government to assist implement its new plan on sector patrols. The command is yet to get a response from the provincial government. Mata Lewis, National MTV News, Lay. Four landowner associations of the Ramon Nickel project in Medang are demanding the national government to immediately release their outstanding business development grant of 10 million kina. Yesterday, the landowners met, stating the project will be disrupted if the government ignores their demand. Landowners Association Chairman Toby Barre said the nickel project is important like other mining sectors in the country. The landowners have waited for the 10 million BDG payments since 2006. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Milne Bay Provincial Government has put in place an ex parte order restraining compensation payments to Goilanai landowners. However, customary landowners say there is no issue over ownership of land, which has delayed the compensation payment. The Alatao Court scheduled the hearing to 25th November 2016. Meanwhile, the customary landowners of Goilanai have removed barricades to bore pumps in one of Water PNG's reservoirs. Water services to Alotau Town were restored as of 6 p.m. last night. A two-day national workshop is currently underway in Port Motby to support Papua New Guinea in implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. The workshop was organized by the United Nations Development Program and the Department of National Planning and Monitoring. Its goal is to share information on the Global Agenda 2030 and the SDGs and brainstorm innovative ways to take the SDGs forward in PNG. The first day of the workshop today brought together a group of strategic partners from government departments and agencies. They focused on familiarizing themselves with the 17 SDGs and the government's role in implementing these goals. 
They also brainstormed on how best the SDGs can be localized and integrated into the government's and country's plans. Secretary for the Department of National Planning and Monitoring, Hakawa Heri, said this was about closing the gap where inequality exists. Now, SDG is a commitment to transform global community into a society that we all can live equally. As such, our commitment to SDGs is critical, very, very critical. And by carrying out our respective roles and functions, we can transform PNG to a desired level that we want to see. UN resident coordinator Roy Trividi said implementing the SDGs requires strong political leadership and strategic partnerships. He said the UN was happy to support PNG. And this is an important moment in history because if we don't get this right, the chances are that we will have a more unstable, more insecure world in the future after 2030. So there is a lot at stake. We believe that by working and starting this work together now, we, are, we can position ourselves well to make sure that the world actually does achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and Papua New Guinea achieves the Sustainable Development Goals. Despite the challenges of relevant data and capacity constraints, Secretary Harry said they are starting the process of implementation of the SDGs early in order to see results by 2030. One of the key messages to come out from the MDG experience is to start early on, local, on the localization process and also for greater awareness and advocacy of the SDGs into what we as government is doing to address this. Tomorrow will be day two of the workshop where representatives of the private sector and civil societies will discuss the SDGs. Deli Waigeno, National MTV News. Chinese Harbor Engineering is currently building new houses for police officers and their families residing at Tassion Barracks in Port Moresby. This comes soon after the residents prevented road construction near the Tassion Barracks Road after their grievances were not met earlier on. MTV News journalist Eric Harupma arrived at the site and spoke to the construction workers. The progress of work at Tassion Barracks looks positive with 21 duplex near completion which will house 42 residents. MTV News visited the site today and saw workers doing final touches on these buildings by plastering walls, painting, plumbing, electrical connection and roofing. This million kina housing project was initiated in June following health concerns raised by Tassion Barracks residents regarding a road construction from Gerewu to Nine Mile. In 2014, 46 police officers and their families residing there submitted a petition to Chinese Aba Engineering for the relocation of their homes prior to the road construction. One of their demands is pertaining to their health and safety, prompting them to ask for relocation away from the barracks. In June, frustrated residents prevented road work at sections of the road, simultaneously calling on the developer to settle their grievances. In response to that, 20 shipment containers of building materials or kits arrived from China to construct their homes. Contractors Orinepo started the project for two months ago, left, but NCDC kept takes and then ended over to Phoenix Construction yesterday. Many workers are local youth. They said these structures have been physically erected beside sophisticated machineries. The scope of work is expected to be completed by the end of December. Eric Arupma, National MTV News. Yarrawari Secondary School made history today when it graduated its pioneer grade 12 students. Despite many challenges, Principal Andrew Moava says the school aims to be a school of excellence in Central Province. 66 students graduated today in front of parents, teachers and other stakeholders, including Central Governor Kila Hauda. Today was history in the making as Yarrawari held a graduation ceremony for its 66 students. Nearly 800 turned up at the Ritafin in the complex to witness the ceremony. Prior to the grade 12 national examinations, the students were given awards using their internal marks. School principal Andrew Moava said Yarrawari has set standards with academic results improving every year. Yarrawari recently upgraded its status to secondary, however, needs more learning facilities. 
The school has been struggling financially but received support from other stakeholders. Former student and central governor Kila Auda says the school will be supported to set a standard in the province. Your destiny in the future lies in your own hands. The parents have done their best, the teachers have done their best, the bottom ones have done their best. It is now to grasp the opportunity. Opportunities are rare. This ceremony today is the 54th graduation for Yarawari, but is the first for grade 12s to pass out from the school. Duo Sota Yamin and Joseph Dagoya locked horns for the grade 12 Dax Award. Macy Crossen got the run-up award, while Nancy Hane and Gewa Kaku received Dax prizes in the humanities. Yarawari once was known as no-go no zone for all central parents, which they get scared to send their students or children to school. But now I'm sure that the school is a good school, safe and a conducive environment for you parents to send your kids to learn as much as they can. Jack LaPave, Jr. National, MTV News. A new method of teaching will soon be introduced in technical and vocational schools in the country. Instructors will be using computers and PowerPoint presentations as teaching tools. More than 80 teachers are being trained at St. Joseph Technical College in Leigh. This method used by the teachers comes with a resource pack for the students who will later graduate with four national certificates. Two of these certificates will be attained at technical and vocational schools, while the others at other institutions. Lina Tarubi, the provincial TVET coordinator, says National Polytechnic Institute of PNG has partnered with PNG University of Technology to provide this service. The two national certificate one and two are supposed to be offered at uh, vocational technical schools. These TVET teachers are now undergoing an in-service to be trained on measures when using the competency-based training and assessment format. With this format, teachers will be using new technologies rather than blackboards. John Moses, the provincial TVET inspector, says the students have to move with the shift in technology. The resource pack will contain all the review questions that this, uh, uh, refer to the, the, the content of the, or the, of the lesson that day. And when the students are given the literature spec, they go home in the night and they read through to answer the question. At the same time, they are studying the notes too as well. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. And now looking at our finance news, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.3155 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, Yokina was buying 0 0.3080 US dollars, 0 0.4015 Australian dollars, 0.2718 Euro and 31.52 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, coffee and cocoa closed higher while gold and copper closed the day lower. Palm oil, crude oil and copper closed the day lower. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 112.58 points higher. The ASX is trading at 30.08 points higher. And the All Ordinaries is trading at 27.79 points higher. Stories making headlines overseas when we come back, including the latest in the U.S. elections and a movie about the most wanted man, Edward Snowden. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. And overseas, Republican candidate Donald Trump has to work harder to bring in new voters who are not sold on his temperament, policy position or readiness to be president. This comes after many Republicans say they will vote for Hillary Clinton after seeing the first debate between the presidential candidates. Robert Klein is a biker, an army veteran and a registered Republican. He says he has never before voted for a Democrat for president. So why is the Nevada resident at a Democratic rally in support of Hillary Clinton? He says the first presidential debate is the reason. Before you watch the debate, who are you going to vote for? Donald Trump. And the debate ended, and what did you think? Totally convinced Hillary Clinton. 
Following the debate, polling indicated a dramatic shift in Nevada, a big swing from Trump to Clinton, one of the biggest turnarounds in the country. And that's because of people like Klein, now attending his first ever Democratic rally. Are you disappointed that Donald Trump didn't convince you that he should be president? Absolutely, absolutely, because I, I've always admired the man. The 55-year-old says it wasn't anything Trump said during the debate that changed his mind. It's the things he didn't say, you know, uh, he never ever speaks that he has a plan or he has some uh, idea what he's really getting into. Shawnice Bonilla is a Nevadan who says she is an independent. Before this debate, did you know for sure who you were going to vote for for president? No. And do you know for sure today? I do, yes. And who is that? I'll be voting for Hillary. Bonilla says Clinton answered questions directly. And as for Trump... He kind of, instead of answering the direct question, he kind of skirts around it. Thomas Stark is a registered Democrat. But after Bernie Sanders dropped out, it was Clinton facing Trump. I wasn't enthusiastic about either one. Or maybe he doesn't but want... after the debate, he also decided yes for Clinton and no for Trump. Nothing. He reminded me of Richard Nixon. And uh, the reason being is that it just looked like he was hiding too much from the get-go. Donald Trump's Nevada campaign stops on this day are part of the effort to stop Clinton's momentum in this state. And many Trump supporters here firmly believe the upcoming debates can help do just that. I think if Trump talks about the issues, then he'll win Nevada. If he goes like the first debate, he'll lose. I have to have faith in humanity and in people, and I think they're going to realize that she is crooked. But Robert Klein says his decision is final. Is it a weird feeling knowing that for the first time you're not going to vote for a Republican for president? Yes, it is. I feel, I feel a kind of betrayal. A 2016 political thriller directed by Oliver Stone is in theaters now. The film follows Edward Snowden, the American computer expert who leaked classified information and has now become the most wanted man in the world. Did you access an unauthorized program? It's Hollywood's take on one of the biggest intelligence leaks in U.S. history, the new Oliver Stone film, Snowden. It reveals new details about how NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden escaped U.S. authorities. The government knows that we have these documents now. Snowden first went public from this hotel in Hong Kong in May 2013, making his bombshell revelations about NSA surveillance programs in an interview with The Guardian newspaper. The NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. Around that time, Hong Kong-based lawyer Robert Tebow was hired to represent the most wanted man in the world. Mr. Snowden was, was nervous uh, when I met with him. The lawyer hid Snowden in the middle of this crowded city for weeks. I advised Mr. Snowden to be placed with refugee families in a populated area, as this would be the last place that anybody would look. The film shows, for the first time, how Thibault took Snowden to stay with impoverished asylum seekers who are his clients. These are good people. They won't talk. Now, after staying in the shadows for years... Hi there. Am I here? Nice to meet you. The real refugees who took turns hiding Snowden are going public. Families like Supun Kelapata and Nadika Nonis from Sri Lanka, who gave their bed in a tiny apartment to an American stranger. Where did he sleep? He slept uh, in our room, the, the corner room. Vanessa Rodell from the Philippines says Tebow showed up unexpectedly one night at her door with Snowden. Was he afraid? Yeah, I feel so afraid. Sorry. Sorry so much. She didn't know who he was until the next day when she spotted Snowden's face on the front page of a Hong Kong newspaper. I see the newspaper. Mm -hmm. It was him. <laughs> the, the guy who's living in your house. I'm very, very shocked. I said, oh my God, <laughs> the most wanted man in the world is in my house. But Rodell continued to shelter and feed Snowden even though, as a refugee, she barely had enough money to feed herself. 
There are at least 14,500 asylum seekers in Hong Kong, some of whom joined this recent protest on behalf of Snowden. The Hong Kong authorities here refuse to accept any of these refugees. Their children are born here stateless. Does he have a passport? No. Does he have a citizenship? <laughs> no. People with the least to give gave the most to protect a man on the run. To this day, he is grateful. They protected me. Uh, they believed in me. Uh, and but for that, I might have had a, a very different ending. Ivan Watson, CNN, Hong Kong. Now, John, Edward Snowden, of course, uh, received refuge in Moscow, where he is today and where he is evading U.S. charges of espionage and the theft of government documents. As for the three refugee families that took him in during his weeks in Hong Kong, they are still here, still very much in legal limbo, and their lives are very difficult. For example, Vanessa Rodell, that Filipino woman that we saw, she just have to let, had to leave her tiny apartment two days ago with her elderly mother and her four-and-a-half-year-old daughter because she says the Hong Kong authorities suspended payments of her rent and her electricity bill, and, of course, she is denied the right to work here in Hong Kong because the Hong Kong authorities simply will not allow these asylum seekers to settle here. So a sign of how difficult and on the edge of poverty these people are living in. Chuka Sports is next. Don't go away. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. To football, PNG striker Raymond Gunemba is happy to be back in the country and training with fellow international teammates. Gunemba arrived on Tuesday afternoon from New Zealand, where he currently plies his professional career. He joins the rest of the national team in a week-long training camp ahead of friendlies in November. The 30-year-old who top scored during the OFC Nations Cup in June expressed delight at being amongst his mates, ready and eager to embark on a new chapter for the country. Third goal of the competition. He picks out Ganemba. What he does well here, takes the dummy. Currently playing with New Zealand Championship side Eastern Suburbs, Gunemba compared the differences in style of play between his current hosts and Papua New Guinea. One, two touches, also touches. So, I mean, time you go join each other team, I mean, me looking at some of the team too. That's Ogata would play one kind of style. Kissy ball, just long balls, that's all. Long ball, so like me need to adjust, but I think me when I'm gone, I'm get, me been get used. Kunemba says the support during the OFC Nations Cup was an unbelievable experience. Me been how much straight low this that time crowd been uh, attendance to crowd low this that uh, time no grand final, but otherwise same performance. Let me play him, me play him, me play him more than blah blah. But after all, there's a winner and a loser. So when I'm result, I'm like over oh, something. I'm still I'm the big player. So yeah. National coach Fleming Siritslev has used the week-long camp to introduce new players into the overall squad, one of whom is sibling Troy, with Raymond showing overall delight at his younger brother being alongside him in the national team. <laughs> the national team will be hoping for friendly matches in November prior to the World Cup, a qualifying campaign in 2017. Jeremy Moggy, National MTV Sports. PNG International Rugby League player Kato Oteo arrived today in Port Moresby. He is in the country for the next three weeks and will return to Australia on the 23rd of October for his knee surgery review. Otio's season with the Mounties was cut short leading into the preliminary finals in the New South Wales Interest Super Cup competition. He was on a contest that the halfback uh, kicked the ball on the air and I contested for it and then 
I landed, but I landed awkwardly. And uh, I did my knee from there. I, I didn't play the whole uh, semi-final. Otio sustained a knee injury and will be out for the next six to seven months. This also saw him miss the Mounties grand final. Yeah, I was out and the boys went through, went through the preliminary finals, qualifying and went to the grand final, but they lost to, fortunately they lost to, um, yeah, Ilora Cutters, yeah. Starting from a train and trial contract with the Canberra Raiders, Otio was able to secure a two-year deal with the Mounties. He said he's learnt a lot over the season from Canberra Raiders coach Ricky Stewart and Mounties coach Steve Antonelli. Especially my position, how wingers play and all that, and uh, how to read defence and jam up and all that, everything, uh, I, learned, I learned a lot. They, Ricky Stevens is a really good coach and he helped me a lot with uh, my Mantis coach, Steven Antonelli. The NRL Telstra Premiership competition is the highest and toughest level of football in the world. Otio said it will be difficult to make it into the NRL. You can't just expect anyone to, you know, just go up and just play top grade because you can't, you, they, don't wanna, uh, they don't want the team to lose because, you know, the, the level of the competition is very high and you know, you can't just go up and look stupid up there. You have to learn like, little things and then move, like keep up from there, move up. He will be in the country for the next three weeks and will be visiting the High Performance Center in Port Mosby for rehabilitation on his knee. These three, all three weeks, I'll be just training in the gym and seeing, Aero, uh, seeing Simon, Simon Morris and then the physio at the uh, High Performance Center. I'm going to go around and see them and yeah, they can... Uh, See my knee and all that. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. Chukai Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. The Motokoita Rugby League Association has plans in place to put up a franchise in the city Intercity Cup. This sentiment was shared by the Motokoita Rugby League Association President P.P. Dai Boy today. He was speaking at the opening of the Motokoita Rugby League Nines tournament at Hubert Murray Stadium here in the nation's capital. With the support of PNGRFL and NCDC, the Motu Koita Rugby League Nines tournament can be a vehicle for rugby league to develop in the Motu Koita villages. The Motu Koita Rugby League Association was introduced in 2014, though known rugby stars like Pinji Hunters Silas Gahuna, Kato Otio, and Brothers Joshua and Blen Abavu, who are all of Motu Koita descent, began their career in other competition prior to the introduction of the association. With a big following of rugby league in the Motukoita villages, this competition is expected to identify and develop talent. Interest is evident as this first-time tournament already has a total participation of 24 teams from almost all Motukoita villages. Our main objective is to lay a platform or lay a foundation for our potential players to come, show their skills, demonstrate their skills, and when they are recognized, then you know they can go through uh, or. Uh, embrace the opportunities uh, at the national level or, you know, uh, SP Hunters or, uh, you know, Southern June uh, level. With the eventual rollout of this initiative, plans are already in place to take the next step and push for a franchise in the Intercity Cup. <laughs> Dini Rose Raiko, National MTV Sports. The Motukoita Rugby League president has echoed the statements made by Sports Minister Justin Tichenko and other on zero tolerance to violence in sports. He said personal development will be encouraged in the Motukoita League in order to address sports violence. One of our objectives of this, uh, our organization is that uh, we will uh, stress and emphasize on uh, zero tolerance to sports uh, violence. And so long as I'm, you know, at the helm, uh, being the uh, president or chairman of the Motokoita Rugby League Association, I will really stress on uh, uh, zero tolerance on sports violence. And also I expect, you know, with this uh, uh, tournament, 
we're hoping to bring some personal development to, to all the players and even the officials as well so that when they go back to their communities, you know, they must uh, ensure that, uh, you know, uh, you know, contribute to uh, reducing social issues, social problems uh, within our respective communities. Grand final hero Andrew Fufita is believed to be disappointed with being deemed ineligible for kangaroo selection that he has threatened to quit the NRL just days after helping the Sharks to a historic premiership. Fifita is understood to have considered quitting the game after an emotional couple of months. Cronulla officials said they have not been contacted by Fifita or his management, but it is understood they are hoping any threat Fifita has made to quit the NRL is an empty one and that he is simply expressing his frustration at the end of a huge week. And that ends Chukai Sports, the weather details for the next 24 hours when we return. True Kai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. Worth doing with Dulux. Your weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region cloudy chances of light rain in Port Mosby, mostly fine in Daru, partly cloudy in Kerma, and a chance of light rain developing in Alotau and Popondeta. In the Momasi region, chances of evening rain showers developing in all centers. In the New Guinea Island region, some showers and thunderstorms in all centers. And in the Highlands region, cloudy periods with chance of light rain in all centers. Ocean forecast for small ships, forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours. Strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesian border to Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerma to Yule Island to Hood Point to Samurai Island including all Milne Bay Islands and Finchafen through Vitia Strait, Thiasi Islands to Long Island to Karkar Island to Medang to Bogia to Manus, also New Island to New Britain and Bougainville. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerama to Yule Island to Hood Point to Samurai Island and with waters of West New Britain, seas of 2.5 to 3.5 meters. Waters of eastern and western Milne Bay Islands with waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel to Finchhafen, seas of 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters of Finchhafen through Vitia Strait. CSC Islands to Long Island to Karkar Island to Medang to Bogia, seas of 3 to 3.5 meters. And waters of Wiwek to Aitape to Vanimo and northern PNG Indonesian border, seas of 0 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea, seas very rough with southeast winds at 34 to 48 knots. In the Solomon Seas, seas rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas slide to very rough with southeast winds at 15 to 25 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas slide with southeast to northeast winds at 10 to 15 knots. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. Worth doing with Dulux. Before we go, in news just in, there was an attempted robbery at Stop and Shop North Waigani late this afternoon. A gang tied up a security guard and entered the shop wearing Stop and Shop uniform and mingled with the customers until the security guard managed to break free and alerted the management and customers. Police arrived at the scene but was not able to catch the gang members.
Lascol came inside the soya, look, or love him said, and the passing me, or lake hand lomi now, or the sleepy milo, walks up now. I mean, Minosa, me making, making, making me, make me go now, me come no. Talk Savello, all the security now, and this time all the escape. Now recapping our main stories for tonight. Elections facing funding challenges, soldiers committed to trial, and lay police arrest robbery suspect. And that's the news, sports and weather for tonight. On behalf of the entire news team, I'm Helen Sayer. Pleasant viewing. Good night.